So yeah, so today I'm going to talk about um, some uh, work um, in preparation uh, with um, a bunch of people. So these are all basically Michael Hutching students. So this is basically a complete list of current students here. So, uh, so Oliver Edmar, Louis Wang, Zhu Wen Zhao, um, <laughs> and Yuan Yao, um, and me. Uh, and basically, the project is uh, to develop um, a version of embedded contact homology with for like that kind of counts all over curves of the Legendre boundary. Um, so I will talk about some motivation for this uh, after I talk about just regular ECH for a little bit. Um, so yeah, so first, um, that's, that's the first thing I'm gonna do is just kind of like give a broad strokes overview of regular embedded contact homology because you know, some of us might not be super familiar with it. And also I kind of want to highlight specifically the stuff that we're trying to replicate in this other theory. Okay, so first of all, uh, Okay, so first of all, ECH stands for embedded contact homology. And uh, what is it? Well, um, it's a variant of SFT. You can think of it as a variant of SFT, although the setup is a little bit different. Um, and it's associated to a closed contact manifold and uh, a uh, contact structure. So it's, it's a closed contact three manifolds. Um, so the basic construction goes like this. So. Uh, so, you know, just like regular symplectic field theory, you start by choosing a bunch of uh, kind of super, uh, superfluous choices. So you first choose um, some non-degenerate contact form uh, alpha and uh, an almost complex structure uh, J on the contact structure satisfying some uh, compatibility properties. Uh, then the chain complex CH builds it like that is generated by orbit sets like oh well, yeah orbit sets so an orbit set is um, so an orbit set is not just like a collection of uh, rave orbits, but it's a collection of simple, it's a seek, it's like a set of pairs of uh, simple rave orbit. Simple means embedded. And uh, multiplicity, um, which I'll write like MI. So the multiplicity will be some positive integer. Um, and these uh, these multiplicities uh, have to satisfy some properties. So first of all, all of these orbits have to be good, um, and then the and then also uh, hyperbolic orbits are only allowed to have uh, multiplicity one, or I think I might have to say negative there. But uh, anyway, so we so there's a certain constraints on these orbit sets. It's not every orbit set, uh, but. Yeah, so one thing to note here is that an orbit set is not the same thing as like a tuple. Like, so if you were thinking about like regular contact homology with the contact DGA, uh, if that's something you're more familiar with, or just like symplectic field theory in general, uh, there the generators are will be something like um, just orbits. Uh, so meaning you can have, you'll have like, a, you know, simple orbits plus like all of their covers. Um, or like the generators could also be in the case of the contact DGA, you know, the generators as a vector space would be like, uh, monomials in those orbits, uh, satisfying some commutivity depending on the SFT grading. So here, the uh, one thing to notice is that the 
like this orbits orbit sets don't really distinguish between like uh, two copies of the set, two copies of the simple orbit, and then a double cover of the same simple orbit. Those would both be like the same orbit set in this kind of theory, right? Okay, and then a differential. So it, I, it's like a set and not a world. It's like a it's like a set and not like a, a map. You know, it's like a, it's counting like the uh, every simple orbit plus. So eta i cannot appear twice. Eta i cannot appear twice. No, it, different yeah, it just it would just appear once, and then there would be a multiplicity that would say how many times it appears. And like as I was saying before, like n co n cover n copies of the same simple orbit would be like the same set as an n fold cover of one simple orbit. Okay, so then uh, the differential counts uh, j holomorphic um, j holomorphic currents. So a current is kind of like the curve, the, uh, like the holomorphic curve version of an orbit set. Uh, so here uh, you have, you know, a current is equal to a sequence uh, or a set like this. Um, maybe I'll use a different letter here, ni, where, um, where again, these things are somewhere injective. They end up being embedded. And then and these NIs are, um, again, some multiplicity. Uh, and here, the, the constraint you want to put on these is that the ECH index is one. So these are, these, you want these to be of ECH index one. And I'll talk about the ECH index in a moment. So um, and here again, one thing that's important here is that like the currents only care about the multiplicity. So for example, like two copies of the same, you know, like uh, if, if I was thinking of currents as coming from a map, you know, if I had a map, if I have a specific an actual J holomorphic map, then that map will represent a current and like uh, some branched, some like double branched cover of a, of a particular somewhere objective curve would be the same as uh, two copies of that's like, you know, the map would be represent the same current as like a, uh, the map from two copies of the surface to the thing, right? So that's kind of the analog of the double cover versus two copies thing that I was talking about with the curves. So you're saying that if you have a double uh, degree two cover from one of the surface to one other, you just replace that thing with two copies of the eight space? Yeah, yeah, you, they're, they're equivalent. They would be considered equivalent currents. Okay. Yeah, so like in the moduli space of currents, you would count them, you would like count them as the same thing. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, all right. Okay, so uh, now I want to talk about the ECH index. So the, the kind of relative version of the ECH index is what this talk is going to be about. Um, I don't really have time to explain everything else that goes into this uh, construction. So this is going to be like the main focus is kind of the intersection theory that goes into that. Um, but, uh, so let me say some things about the regular ECH index first. So the ECH index is a kind of, you can think of it as a sort of topological, um, modification of the Fredholm index. I'll try to make that a little more precise right now. Um, so first recall, that if uh, nu is some uh, J curve, say finite energy J curve, it asymptotes to some, um, you know, so it's some J curve in the symplectization of some of a contact manifold, um, asymptotic to some orbits at plus or minus infinity. Okay. So now I mean, ask, you know, here it'll be asymptotic to some actual orbits. So those are the things that I'm denoting by gamma i, gamma plus minus i. Um, but here, these also will represent some orbit set with orbit set gamma plus minus. I like this. Yeah. 
So here, each of these like, each of these gamma eyes will just be some cover of one of these uh, eta eyes, right? And then this is this is like the actual orbits that you asked them to, and this is like the orbits, the underlying orbit set of the thing, right? Okay, so in this, so with the setup, I can write the Fredholm index. Uh, in dimension three, as, uh, like this. So here, um, I have like chosen a trivialization, and. Uh, So here I've chosen some trivialization along, or along, let's say along the simple orbits, eta i, which induce a bunch of trivializations of all the gamma i's. Um, this thing is this kind of uh, relative churn class, okay, which is well-defined once you pick one of these trivializations. And then these things are all columns indices. So these are all the columns indices of those. And the ECH index has a really similar formula. So this thing is given by um, well, they want a lot, involves a lot of the same terms, except now it has this kind of intersect, self intersection number, which I'm going to elaborate on a little later. Um, and then this thing has, and then it also has, in addition to these terms, um, a Conley Zander term that's sort of uh, that's different from the um, the Conley Zander term there. So uh, this one looks like this. And then a similar term for the minus stuff. Okay, so um, yeah, so here, uh, so here, I'm going to call like this whole term. Uh, this is like standard notation in the kind of ECH literature. This I'm just going to call this CZI of uh, U to denote that this is like the Conley Zander term for the ECH index, and then this thing is going to be CGN or CZN. just to denote the different two different terms. Um, so one of them, notice one of them just involves the underlying simple orbits and the multiplicity. So this one is obviously only dependent on the orbit set, but this one actually is different than this one and it involves the Conley's inner indices of the actual orbits. Okay, and one of the cool things, one of the cool things about the ECH index here is that the ECH, ECH index is kind of a purely topological quantity in the sense that it actually doesn't depend on the underlying surface. So meaning the surface sigma. Uh, instead, it only depends on basically a homology class um, associated to the map U, uh, basically some homology class and like the relative homology of Y with respect to the orbits at the, the orbit sets at the end. Um, and of course, the, or the original orbit sets, so the, the eta i's and the multiplicities. But it doesn't depend on like the, on like sigma. And in particular, it's, a, it's just a function of the current represented by U and not actually of U. Okay. So that's a, a CZ eta i to the power of what inside um, the box? So this is like I take the sum over all the orbits in the orbit set of the sum from one to the multiplicity of the Conley Zander index of that simple orbit raised to the multiplicity. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so it's like the sum of all the multi of the Conley Zander indices of all the multiplicities up to the one that appears in the orbit set. Okay, so, uh, yeah. So, so, for example, if I would have um, like two different sigmas mapped to the same image in M. Yeah, like if you had two different surfaces, like let's say, for instance, I had two different surfaces. Yes, and I that were like through like a cover. That, yeah, that were branched covers yeah. of the same degree right. of some initial simple curve. They would have the same. And they would have the same ECH index, but not necessarily the same Fredholm index, mm -hmm. right? right? So that's like an interesting, that's like a, a cool thing that the ECH index does. So has Michael ever told you how he came up with this formula? Uh, I've heard him, I mean, this is- what Well, the, the, this formula was already kind of understood in the Gromov-Taub situation. Mm -hmm. So like, if you kind of look at Gromov-Taub's theory, this is like just the closed 
version of that. And then once you add the correct colonization, like I, you can kind of imagine piecing this together from the Gromov Taubes theory if, if you knew how, if you already knew about the Gromov Taubes invariance. Um, but, uh, but I haven't actually asked. I mean, it was a, it was a process. Like it took him a long time, actually. I mean, so there, there's say, probably more subtleties than that. I've heard you say that this is what you put in this grave. Oh yeah, I for sure. Yeah, it's like it's, that's why I'm like I'm kind of like hesitant to say that it's anything that straightforward. But it's it's I, you could imagine beginning to come up with this by starting with the Gromov tops thing and then sort of working from there. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm not sure, so I don't want to like I don't want to like the little Michael's like life work. It's pretty awesome index. So yeah. Okay, so let me talk about let me talk about from my perspective what. The, what the kind of key properties that you see each index are, the things that kind of make ECH work, right? Or one of some of the or list of things that make ECH work. So the first thing is the is something called the ride bound. Uh, this isn't strictly speaking about the ECH index, but it's about the Conley Zaner term in the ECH index. So here, if U is somewhere injective, uh, then uh, there's a well-defined uh, writhe, um, which, so I'll call it writhe of u. And this is roughly speaking, the writhe of the braids uh, traced out uh, by uh, the cylindrical ends of u. Okay, so so what I mean by that is like I have a some curve u does something non-trivial in the middle, and then at the ends there will be some uh, you know you'll have like the cylindrical end and it'll be asymptotic to some orbit, and around that orbit um, this end maybe I'll draw the orbit in different colors. So the orbit's red, um, and what will happen is as you approach the that orbit. Um, this uh, end will basically uh, wrap around the um, that that orbit uh, in some way. And in fact, if you have multiple branches of the same, like you have multiple different uh, ends coming into the same orbit, uh, then uh, this is kind of a non-trivial fact. But the union of those, uh, like the union of those um, ends, will form some braid. So they won't actually, in kind of in the limit, they won't intersect. They'll just form some nice braid around the simple orbit. So some kind of delicate asymptotic thing. And in particular, uh, uh, that will, so you can take that braid and you can kind of analyze it as a braid once you pick a trivialization, which identifies this with just like the standard kind of S1 cross D2, right? Um, and so the writhe here is just the writhe, the writhe in a particular trivialization is just the writhe of that, of that braid, right? This is kind of summed over all the ends um, with, with the sun. And the thing, uh, well, hold on, hold on. Can you hold your pressure really quick and then I'll. Okay, and the ride bound states that the ride of U is bounded above by the difference between the Colony Zander terms. So, action, so, and, uh, and the ride bound being inequality has some really like strong geometric meaning, which I'm, I won't really have time to get into, but this is basically, uh, you know, this is an inequality. And then when it's an inequality, something pretty special happens involving kind of the ends of the, the curve. Presumably the ride is always positive or not negative? Uh, I don't think it has to be, uh, let me, I don't, yeah, I don't think it has to be actually not, not negative, but uh, I mean, it depends on the trivialization, for example. Like if you change trivialization, you can make the right negative. Sure, but like, is it true that the the ECH condensed index term is greater equal than the standard one? Um, I don't think so. I mean, the negative. If I think if the I think if this is neg, I think if it's negative, you can have situations where the right where this right of like for I know well. Okay, I know for a fact that the right that the right part can at least be negative. I I don't want to commit to anything with the index part, but I'm pretty sure you could also make that negative. Okay. So, yeah, actually, okay, I could probably give you some examples after the talk, yeah. but yeah. Anyway, so this this is the first thing is that the sort of the difference really sh you should interpret it as actually being an almost exact measurement of this of this writhe 
Okay, like a very good upper bound. That's that's a quality in some nice situations. Can you say something? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Should it be an epsilon or an epsilon? No. Well, the uh, so the rise. So if you change framing, you get the negative of it. So if you if you if you change orientation on the ends, you negate. Yeah. Okay. You kind of negate everything. So yeah. Oh um, no! This is this should be the right. I mean, I, I'm hiding some signs in this in this formula for CZU, where I'm like switching signs when I choose the which end yeah, I'm on. Um, and the the so the framing comes from the trivialization theorem. Um. Yeah. The framing. Well. Yeah. The trivial. I mean, the trivialization gives you a framing of this, like gives you an identification of this neighborhood with D two cross S one. Okay. Right, and then because the because xi is and you know the contact structure is like the normal direction. Yeah. So. Um, okay, so the second thing is an index inequality. Okay, so this one is uh, follows from a junction, so it's a simple um, consequence of a junction, which is this formula. So a junction is uh, this is like a a version of a junction for these cylindrical curves. And it says this, that uh, take, okay, so what this says is that if you look at the relative churn class, this is the, if the relative churn number, this is equal to the Euler number plus the self-intersection form, uh, plus the self-intersection, plus some correction coming from the rise. Minus uh, some term coming from the singularities of the Hallmarker curve. Okay. Is that 28? Where? Oh, this is supposed to be two times the delta. <laughs> yeah, and this is the singularities. Number, this is like kind of the number of singularities uh, counted appropriately. You mean like critical points of multiplicity? Yeah. Like critical points of multiplicities and also self intersections of, of different branches, also with multiplicity. Um, okay, and then, uh, okay, so as a consequence of the, this version of injection, for some more injective curves, uh, and then you know you add this to the rad inequality, the rad bound, uh, we get. That the index, so the front home index, bounded above by um, the uh, ECH index minus two times the number of singularities. Um, so as a cor as as corollary, if the indices are the same, then this number of singularities is zero, and that implies that the U is embedded. Right, because if they're equal, then this thing has to be zero. So I guess it's both a count of critical points plus of itself. Plus of itself of self intersections. Yeah. So sing by singularities, I mean like self intersections and critical points. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, I had a few more things, but I'm just skipping them because I'm already because I'm, I'm basically spending the entire time just giving an intro to ECH now. So I want to like. Oh, this this thing I said is true. In general, is true for any. Curve. No, but I mean, uh, is it true that uh, um, ECH index one curve is the breadth index one curve? Or yeah, 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 but that 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 thing is. Uh, I mean, here I'm just positing equality, but I'm saying like when I have now, yeah. Another thing you could say is that if something is ECH index one, that that's actually what I was about to say. It's if something is ECH index one, that implies that it's like a consist of a single connected in, in front home index one thing, and then a bunch of trivial cylinders. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so today what I'm gonna do is basically explain um, a relative version of all of that. Um, so, uh, okay, so first the setting. So today, let's say relative. This stuff. Um, so the setting uh, is a sutured torque manifold. 
uh, with plus uh, closed Legendrian possibly disconnected. Into boundary. I'll, I'm going to briefly explain what this stuff means. Um, so the thing, so the two things I'll really explain um, in detail are first some maximum principles, which hold in this setting, which allow you to talk about currents in a reasonable way, which actually isn't really possible if you have just arbitrary Legendre and boundary. It's in the boundary. In the boundary. Yes, so I have a sutured content. I'll, I, I, will, I will draw you a picture in a second if you're confused by this sentence. Um, and then the other thing I'll explain is the intersection theory that leads to um, the ECH index. Okay, and so um, why would I be, why would I want to do this? Um, well, that's a good question. So the first, so I'm going to give you like a list of motivations here, and if I, if you have more questions about them, I can elaborate afterwards. Um, yeah. So the first thing, first reason why you might be interested in a construction like this is because, uh, so there are actually there are kind of like two. Um, so you know, you have embedded contact homology. It's known that embedded contact homology and Haggard floor homology are isomorphic. Um, now, there's a version of Haggard floor homology. Uh, by, that was written down by Lipschitz, um, which actually fits directly into this framework. Uh, and that's very interesting because it kind of says that the normal ECH and Higgard floor homology are actually just edge cases of the same thing. So uh, that kind of opens up the possibility of those things being related by some surgery formula that's much more natural than kind of the current way that the isomorphism is constructed. Um, so that's kind of motivation number one is like we'd like to realize like a real good reason why Haggard floor homology and ECH are the same, right? Um, and presumably because there's also this formulas uh, having to having to do with reconstructing the Haggard floor of the closed manifold from the compositions into sutured pieces. Yeah, yeah, that, that might that story may be related to this. I'm actually not totally sure how this. It's not it's not in an obvious way. I mean, presumably, once you set up this theory, you would like some sort of computational tools along with. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there's probably some. There's probably something like I haven't really thought about. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah. So that ideally, you would have some sort of like Legendrian surgery formula that would basically tell you like I do surgery on this Legendrian, and it gives me something that has equivalent ECH, and that then that would be your invariance proof would be something like that. Uh, now, how exactly you would do this kind of using existing technology or kind of stuff that looks like kind of the current relative, relative Higgard floor homology stuff, I'm not really sure. Um, but that's, a, yeah, that's exactly the kind of, motive, the kind of thing we're, we have in mind. Um, so the other, okay, so another thing is that uh, another really cool thing that this is related to uh, is the following. So if you consider like an S1 value of Morse function, right? Uh, that thing has a gradient flow. Um, now, uh, when the Morse function has no critical points, this is basically a mapping torus of some surface, right? If you're in three dimensions. And in that case, ECH, the kind of analog of ECH is PFH. Um, and uh, so there you have kind of a nice theory of the flow and you can, you can use that to kind of uh, uh, categorify um, this kind of theory of like zeta fun relating zeta functions to the Reitermeister torsion that Michael wrote about in his thesis. Um, so Michael, the first, the way that Michael kind of proposed this project to us was like, he would really like to understand the case where you had critical points in that. Uh, and it turns out that one of the ways you can kind of deal with the critical points is by deleting a neighborhood of them and introducing a boundary component. And those boundary components have exactly this kind of, have something that's almost exactly the structure. I mean, it's a little bit different because you're not kind of in the exact setting, but it's, very, very similar to this. So basically the, the, cru the crux of it is if you want to do PFH like for things with critical points, you have to kind of start, you have to start thinking about this kind of thing. Uh, okay, I have a couple other things, but I want to get to the actual stuff. So let me do that. Okay, so first of all, um, what is a, uh, convex sutured manifold. These are basically the spaces that are kind of involved in this thing. Uh, 
Okay, so a convex sutured contact manifold. Um, is uh, so it consists of the following things. So a compact manifold uh, with boundary and corners. Um, so the boundary decomposes into three pieces. So the kind of a plus boundary, uh, a sutured boundary, which I'll talk about in a second, and then a minus boundary. What is the dimension of y? Uh, y just, I'm right, I mean, it'll be odd because it'll be a contact. I'm gonna, I'm about to put a contact structure on it. Yeah. So it has uh, three boundary components um, and then uh, contact structure. And then here I wanna fix kind of an identification of the sutured part of the boundary with um, some interval crossed with a submanifold I'll call sigma. This is the suture. Um, and then a contact structure. Uh, xi, um, which is the, uh, or some contact form alpha where, um, where that satisfies two properties. So the first property is that um, alpha restricted to the plus and minus boundary. So these two boundary components is a um, removal form. Okay, so meaning it gives these two pieces of the boundary the structure of a little limit. Uh, and then the second property is that um, if, uh, is that in neighborhood, Uh, you. Let me this up a little bit. Okay, so in a neighborhood with these coordinates, so first I have this zero t coordinate, which I'll call t, crossed with uh, some caller neighborhood of sigma. Uh, so in this neighborhood, um, alpha is of this form. So it's dt plus e to the tau uh, alpha restricted to sigma. OK, so basically what it's saying is that if you look at the plus or minus boundary, the restriction of the contact form is a little form. And if you look near the sutured boundary, the kind of contact form will be some kind of standard symplectization of contactization type. Can I think of like you will have this like uh, Anvik plus? Like, uh, so you have a, basically the dividing set being the suture uh yeah some, something yeah basically yeah something like that exactly like if you take a hypersurface inside of the thing and you kind of just, so to say two pieces well like this yeah. yeah we can can i give it like an example here which will probably confirm what you're saying is that um if i take any google domain w lambda and then i take y given by just an interval crossed with W. Um, and then, uh, you know, alpha will just be uh, dt, this is the t variable, um, plus uh, lambda. So for example, like the disk crossed with um, the interval. And then this is like the, so the minus boundary will be the, will be zero cross y or zero cross W. Um, the plus boundary would be uh, zero cross uh, one cross W. And then the sutured boundary would be like the boundary, uh, the boundary of, uh, well, zero one cross with the boundary of W. And then the suture sigma would just be boundary W. All right, so this is the most basic example of something like this, right? Um, okay, so, Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, I literally mean a Legendrian in the boundary. So, Legendrian, 
So here we want to fix. Uh, but the boundary is not a contact one. <laughs> Um, well, okay, but, the, but a, a submanifold in the boundary can be, should be considered inside of the, the whole thing. And then it's, uh, okay. Right? Yeah, I don't, I don't mean uh, it's a Legendrian considered within the boundary. I mean, it's a, Legend, it's a Legendrian which happens to be in the boundary. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so we will consider uh, disconnected uh, Legendrians. Um, so, which, you know, so lambda. That is the union of two pieces where um, lambda plus is inside of partial plus and lambda minus, or I'll just say lambda plus minus inside of partial plus minus y. So, so Legendre in each of those pieces. Um, this is a pretty strong condition because, in particular, it says that basically this thing is a, a Lagrangian inside of the boundary, which is like extremely strongly exact in the sense that the Liouville form is zero on it. But in surfaces, this is not that bad of a constraint. So for surfaces, you can kind of find, uh, there are lots of examples. Um, so for example, uh, if I have like a, um, a surface with boundary uh, with some genus G, and I pick a bunch of loops so that, the, so that if I delete those loops, it becomes genus zero, then I can always pick a Louisville form on that thing so that those loops are Legendrians in, the, in this kind of resulting thing. Yeah. Is it very important that they are exactly in the boundary? Or? Uh, it is very important that they're, I mean, it's important that they're in the boundary. Uh, if two of them are isotopic in the ambient, I mean, it's important that they're in the boundary. I mean, for the intersection theory stuff, it's really important that they're in the boundary. Okay, because otherwise you could pick something that is not in the boundary, but that is a lift of a ground gen. I think you could probably, you could, I mean, you could, if you had something that was like where, the if you had something where the restriction of the level form was d was it was still exact like it was equal to df then probably you could modify perform a modification to get the zero thing to be true um like the you know you could for a surface yeah like in high dimension for a surface yeah and then and then um i mean we could talk about it even in higher dimensions it seems like but anyway I, I think you might be able to generalize this a little bit but it would ultimately amount to basically modifying your original setup to be to fit into this framework so yeah okay so um okay so this is the situation that we're in and we're in three dimensions okay all right so uh i'm saying something about homework or curves Okay. So here, um, first I need to tell you, so, okay, so if I have a complex structure on one, on the contact structure of one of these things, then like, um, I have to impose some extra conditions on it in order to, uh, get all the homework for curves to be well behaved. This is sort of makes a lot of sense. So a complex structure is, um, is, I, uh, is tailored um, to the sutured structure if, um, first of all, uh, it is rate invariant near the boundary. So near all the boundary components, you want it to be invariant under translation of the rate vector field. And then the second condition is that um, near the positive and the negative boundary, uh, J is the pullback of a contact type structure on the plus or minus boundary um, via the projection, uh, which goes from the contact structure, which is you know inside of the in a space of Y. Isn't, uh, isn't A a strong condition? Maybe a... Um, it's not as strong as it looks because it's because uh, well, because of the codimension. So the, basically, like you can essentially choose. It's this is essentially equivalent. This these two pieces of data. Are essentially equivalent to choosing two complex structures on the two sides, mm -hmm. such that under the identification between their kind of like contact boundaries, uh, they are the same complex structure. 
Um, and that is that is not a very hard thing to do. You know, that's like a basically you're picking a contact structure on sigma. You're picking a kind of complex structure, or complex structure on the contact structure for sigma for the suture. Then you're just extending it to the two, to the two positive there's, and negative. There, there's no obstructions at all. Not really. I mean, you can always find you can always find this. It's pretty easy to get it to be satisfied. Yeah. So um, okay. And uh, so why are complex structures like this good? Well, so the reason they're good is because of the following kind of maximum principle type thing. This is from this Kalan, Gagini, Hatchik, Honda paper about sutured uh, contact homology. So J is tailored and uh, tau, first of all, tau. So tau is the, it remember is the simplectization coordinate um, near the sigma boundary. So it's like the kind of, you know, you have kind of a normal direction to, to, the, to the suture. Um, that's what uh, tau is. And the statement is that tau is um, very subharmonic. Uh, as a function of the, um, uh, you, you can think of it as a function on kind of the simplectization direction cross with sigma, if you want. Um, and then also uh, T composed U uh, is also harmonic if U is a J curve. Uh, so that means that if I have a if I have some J homomorphic curve. Um, and its image lands somewhere where the t variable is defined. So the t variable is kind of defined in, in a neighborhood of the plus and minus boundary, as well as near the near the near the sutured boundary. So this t like polar. Or What's up? T is, t is the, the t is the coordinate. Um, oh, the suture is kind of the ray of coordinate in a neighborhood of the plus and the minus boundaries, right? So it's like that that color neighborhood or that color coordinate. What is tau? Uh, tau is so if you if you look at the suture. Right, you have uh, this. Um, where do I put it? You have this. This neighbor. You have like this neighborhood of the. I, I covered it with this thing, and I can't lift it. Okay, so here you have this kind of this neighborhood of uh, the uh, the sutured boundary, which is basically like. You know, the suture crossed with the time direction, crossed with some caller coordinate um, in the boundary, and it's it's that coordinate. So it's like the coordinate pointing in radially inward from the disk. So you cannot have maximum visible in that direction. Basically. You, you can't have uh, things crossing that way. Right. Um, okay. So a standard a standard. Sorry, my computer is fucking up. Don't do that. Okay, great. So a standard uh, consequence of this, um, yeah, so corollary samba is that, um, first of all, you can't have any interior, you can't have any interior points of a holomorphic curve. So if, if uh, corollary, if, you have some holomorphic curve, maybe it's some finite energy. J curve um, with like some finite energy proper J curve with uh, that sends the boundary of the surface uh, into um, the simplectization of lambda. So in this case, then uh, First of all, the inverse image of the boundary is going to be the boundary of sigma. So that means you can't have any interior points of the curve, of the curve that map to um, the boundary of y. OK. Yeah, I should say, um, let me say r cross boundary y. So it can't, yeah, so the boundary of the, you can't have the boundary of, um, uh, you can't have interior points of the surface hitting the, uh, hitting the boundary of y. That's number one. And then number two is that um, uh, U is actually transverse um, to the boundary. So you actually can't have any boundary critical points um, either. 
Yeah. And here, the second point, T completely is harmonic, it's also specific to functional tree. Uh, it's okay. Th yeah, this is great. This is a great question. So this is, yeah, I should say that. So um, this is in dimension three. Thank you. Yeah, so in, arbit in arbitrary dimensions, it's true if, if the uh, complex structure is, is integrable. Uh, but in dimension two, you can all, in dimension two, it's always true. So that's, that's fine. But yeah, thank you. This is something that I'm, I only will say here in dimension three. I think you also have <laughs> the same structure, like something more. Yeah, I think it needs to be stunned. I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, the, the hypothesis they use, I think, is that, yeah, it needs to be stunned because I think you need the, yeah, I think you need the symplectic form to be the uh, Actually, you need a bit DJ. Okay, well, yeah, so here, I mean, here you can always pick the complex structure. You can always, like, make the complex structure compatible with some stunned structure on the, on the, uh, Surface. I mean, it's yeah. Dimension two makes this these issues a lot easier. Um, but yeah, you're right. So in higher dimensions, this is a more subtle thing. Um, okay. So uh, the maximum principle thing is pretty obvious. So let me just explain really quick. Or the you know this this first point about the interior points not being able to touch the boundary is essentially immediate from the maximum principle. So let me explain this critical point thing, which is kind of kind of neat and uh, it's also pretty easy. So to show um, that U is transverse to the boundary, um, it suffices to show that um, T composed of U uh, has no, um, well, let me say that zero, um, let me say zero and one uh, are not values of T composed of U, uh, or in other words, um, that uh, T composed of U has no critical points on the boundary of sigma. Okay. Um, and so the reason that that's true is that, um, so uh, let's say that E is in the boundary. Uh, and let's say that uh, at the boundary, um, let's say at that point, um, so T composed with U um, So if I write uh, T composed with U of P plus C, then I get, you know, let's say this tail, let's say I can tailor expand this as U of P. Uh, plus um, some non-zero z to the uh, k term, plus um, sorry, let me. I'm trying to think of a good way of saying this. Uh, let's say it like this. So sorry, guys. My notes are like really. Uh, So let's say I could write this as, so, okay, let me, I, so I'm gonna say something different than what's in my notes because now that I'm reading what's in my notes, I don't like it. Uh, okay, so, so if you have P in the boundary of sigma, then T composed with U is the real part of some uh, holomorphic function. Uh, with um, leading order, uh, you know, of order, K, like with vanish, vanishing to order K, let's say. Okay. So that means that it's, uh, so yeah, so T composed with U will look like um, the real part of some function uh, of the form, you know, A plus, um, uh, B Z to the K, where Z to the K, like K is the order of vanishing, um, plus, uh, dot, plus some higher order stuff, right? Okay, now uh, that means that the inverse image of zero is 
the inverse image of zero um, intersected with the neighborhood of P uh, will look like this. So you'll have um, kind of the boundary of sigma. Here's P. Um, and then you'll have uh, like a bunch of branches. Okay. And that's the invert. That is, these are like the, all of these things are the things that map to zero under T inverse of B of, uh, of zero. Um, and there will be uh, K plus one branches where K is the order of vanishing. Um, but we know that, uh, we know that, um, that uh, T composed of U inverse of zero is some open subset of the boundary. Right, so we know that the that this you know this the inverse image of this thing is just going to be some open neighborhood inside of the boundary. In particular, it's only going to have two branches coming out of P, and that implies that K is one, uh, which implies that it's not singular there. Right. So basically, the the crux of it comes down to the fact that like the boundary is uh, the level set of a harmonic function. And you can't have the level set of the harmonic function if you have a critical point will have to have these singular areas that have like multiple kind of branches coming into it. Um, and here, since we already know a priori that the boundary is not singular, that implies that the uh, that there can't be any branches. Sorry, mm -hmm. Can you repeat the argument? Okay, so the argument basically boils down to the boundary is the level set of T composed U and uh, T composed U is harmonic near there. Um, if there was a critical point, the, the level set of the zero level set would have to be a singular thing. But we know that it's a smooth thing. And that actually just implies that it can't, that the, conversely, the harmonic function can't be, uh, can't, can't be singular there. Okay, so. Wow, I'm really running out of time here. Um, Okay, so a nice, so a second property, which kind of is a consequence of some of this, um, is that U factors as, um, so if I have a U like this, then U factors uh, through a simple map. Um, where uh, phi is a branch cover. With no boundary branches, points, and uh, and v is um, an embedding away from finitely many uh, singularities. So by singularities, again, I mean kind of point singular points of the map, and also self intersections. Um, now, this is not true for an arbitrary, um, like it, it's not true if you just looked at like holomorphic curves with Lagrangian boundary, but the fact the presence of an actual boundary boundary in this uh, discussion uh, basically keeps um, kind of, uh, it, it prevents the existence of basically maps that do not factor uh, at all uh, through higher degree covers. Um, but uh, which are nonetheless, which are nonetheless like not injective, not injective anywhere, or not injective in some places, or multiply covered in some places, which can happen um, in in other settings. So like about this lantern. Yeah, yeah. So like this guy, like the yeah. thing that does like this. Yeah. This, this kind of picture. This is like something where it's like injective here, but not injective here, and it doesn't really factor like well, you know. So. Okay. okay. Can you repeat why this can't happen? So it, it basically the okay, so geomet I don't really know I'm like totally running out of time, but geometrically the reason is because if you had a branch point like this, one of the sheets would have to cross the boundary. Like you can kind of imagine it. It's like if one of the if you have if it's like wrapping around the thing, one of the sheets has to go through. So and that can't happen because there's nowhere to go, you know. Okay. Uh, so this whole discussion basically tells us that it's a completely sensible thing to talk about currents. Right. This is like we can, in general, like what we want the we want the currents to be is we want the 
a current to be, you know, a collection, a sequence of, of holomorphic curves with multiplicities. And then the, L, the, you know, the elements of the current are basically the maps V that satisfy this kind of hypothesis, where we can really start to talk about intersection theory and stuff. Okay, so I'm like basically completely out of time. So the, the last thing I'm going to do. So the last thing I'm going to do is state is like explain uh, what um, I'm just going to write down the relative adjunction formula and sort of explain uh, each of the terms. Okay, so uh, let me just do that and then I will kind of uh, if write down that ACH index just to have something to point to. Okay, so um, okay, so I, I'm out of time, but the last thing I was going to talk about was first kind of the analog of adjunction. So uh, so here, this is bit, adjunction is kind of a, a mostly topological thing, uh, but uh, what it says. So in this case, the way the formula reads is this. If I have a current, um, or if I have a, let's say, um, simple J curve, um, with average. Uh, then the thing that holds is that uh, you have this version of a junction. Um, so it looks exactly like the old adjunction. Let me just tell you what each of these things are. So this thing is a Maslow index um, that you get uh, by basically taking the kind of uh, pullback of the tangent bundle along with the Lagrangian sub bundle of the boundary given to you by the tangent space of the Lagrangian. Uh, and then you um, you take the pullback of the context structure with that Lagrangian sub bundle and then you use the you use a trivialization tau to complete that to a loop of Lagrangians on the boundary, then you take its Maslow index. Uh, this thing is the Euler characteristic of sigma, except there's a it's actually has a half integer correction. Um, coming from the fact that the boundary components mapping to the Legendrian should only count for half if they're, if they're kind of open intervals. Uh, this thing is a self intersection number, uh, which you can, turns out like if you have kind of a four manifold with uh, a two manifold at its boundary, then you can define that intersection number for surfaces with boundary in that sub manifold. Um, and this is actually a well defined thing. Uh, and it's half integer value. So the boundary intersections kind of again count for half. This is something you can extend to this case. Uh, the ride is basically the same ride as before, except now you kind of have some, uh, you can also define the ride for kind of the open braids coming from the chord part. Um, and then these are again, counts of singularities. Epsilon is the boundary? Epsilon are the boundary singularities, which are, these are just self-intersections of the bound of self-intersections. On the boundary. Uh, okay. And then also we have a kind of, uh, so I don't have time to explain the Collins Andrew index or the right bound, but there's also a version of the right bound. Uh, and when you put them together, you get a really nice um, formula for the ECH index, which is very similar to the one uh, in the open case. It's just, a, it specializes to that. Basically, have you set up the whole theory? Well, so right now I'm just explaining this. Um, you know, I, here I just explained kind of the, the easy, how to define the index. Yeah. So the, the kind of the really hard stuff you have to do, so this is like the obstruction bundle gluing, is actually not that much harder in this case, just because uh, you don't really have to do any obstruction bundle gluing along the ends that go to quartz. Uh, the only hard places are the ends that go to orbits. And there, because you have a rise bound equality, it's kind of the same partitions. It, you have exactly the same partition conditions as, as the standard case. Um, so there's essentially not a lot of hard stuff that actually goes into the setting up the kind of like the really difficult stuff that Hutchings and Taubes did 
um, to set up normal ECH is not really, like you don't really have to do more work um, so for that stuff here. Reuse whatever they do. Yeah, you can reuse a lot of it. So what's, so the state is that you have a well-defined relative uh, ECH then? Well, so the, the statement now is that we would, we have a, the statement that's gonna be in the paper is that we have a, a chain complex, we have its differential and the differential squares to zero. Um, and it's independent on choices. Okay, so that's that's the part that's a little more subtle. Okay. Because that because we would need some kind of cyber written model for this to really know. I see. Um, but yeah. You want to do, do you want to perhaps optimize more to as much as you do? Um, maybe I should finish. Maybe I should be like I'm done. Yeah. And then we can keep talking. Okay. Thank you. I didn't really get to the main point, but any questions besides mine? Yes. So these guys <clears throat> also have interior punctures. Uh, yeah. 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 So this is a this the whole theory is with interior punctures. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. They're counting value curves with Lagrangian boundary conditions in the four manifold. What's up? They're counting value curves with Lagrangian boundary conditions in the simple four manifold. You think whatever is done develop here. You can find embedded curves. I mean, can you count the I invariant of cutting embedded curves? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, boundary conditions. This is actually a great question. I do not, like it, we probably should have done this first, but but uh, I, I do not know what the Grand Tau's version of this is. That's a group, that's, this is, a, yeah. So I think if you have like a, yeah. So if if you had a close, yeah. If you had like a, a four manifold with boundary, the boundary satisfies, the maximum principle and like you have to you know you could probably play with the class that you're actually using uh but you know the boundary you pick some class of complex structures along with the nice property boundaries such that it satisfies the maximum principle and you have a lagrangian sub manifold of the boundary then run this story i think you should be able to get a form of an invariant uh again i think the question like a direct proof of invariance i, I don't remember if this is actually something they have in grown taus Grand Tabs land. Like if this is something that can prove he can prove without going through the cyber written. I think so. Equivalence. Yeah. Yeah, we should talk about this because I, I, I actually think this is a very interesting like uh, thing to try. Because I mean, yeah, like kind of relative uh Grom Witten theory is like a very difficult higher genus relative Grom Witten theory is like generally a very difficult thing. So I think a ver some version of it using this kind of thing would be cool. You know? If I give you a closed Three manifolds. Like, is there a natural way to construct uh, the composition of it into two true ones, like from an open book? Uh, well, yeah, a good book. Um, <clears throat> and I guess you can decompose it into two and convex one. things, kind of glued along. And one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, here, I guess. I, I, okay. So if I had like a Hagard, like, uh, if you're interested, I can kind of explain the. How this setup works with the Lipschitz I mean, thing? You want to pair this with the surgery formulas from Hegelfleur, right? I mean, you, you want to no, no, no. So I, I mean, it would be a new kind of new surgery formula because uh, I mean, it wouldn't. I don't think it would fit really cleanly into the surgery formulas from Hegelfleur because, like, I mean, here you would you would start with a Hegel diet. Like, let me sort of can I, can I sort of explain? Sure, sure. Great. Okay, so this is. Something I would have, I really needed to cut down this talk. I don't know why I thought I would have more time than this, but uh, so this, the way that kind of the Lipschitz thing fits into this framework is you take a surface, G to G, okay, cross it with the interval, and delete a, delete a disk. So delete like a tube. Okay, so now both sides, this is basically exactly sutured thing, right? It's like an open surface with boundary and then cross with this thing, right? Uh, now here you have, uh, so I can pick Lagrange on these two sides, which are just like alpha and beta circles of a, of a Hager diagram, right? Um, yeah, I'm just gonna draw random shit. And then, uh, and then this thing has no orbits. So it just has ray ports. Right, and the ray chords exactly correspond to intersections between this uh -huh. thing, right? Uh -huh. um, and now uh, the uh, 
So Lipschitz is set up slightly different in the sense that he's not really working with a contact structure, but with something pretty close. But you can, it's not really, that's kind of an important, unimportant detail. Um, but anyway, so now you kind of run this kind of ECH construction in that setting. I claim that you will get something of this sort of relatively obviously higher floor homology. Uh, at least a sector, a sector of the resulting. It's a relatively obvious. I mean, <laughs> basically, basically Lipschitz wrote it, wrote the entire de wrote the details of this down. Lipschitz really wrote the details of this down pretty carefully, and the, the, you, all you have to do is kind of translate between. So you're saying that the relative ECH of this thing is the Hagenfler. Is is Lipschitz is very is Lipschitz's in just a complete in just a slightly different language is exactly just Lipschitz's version of Hagenfler homology, which he wrote down in exactly this setting. So he has like a version of Hager formology, literally does it this way. Uh, and then the search, the thing that we would, the thing that you have to wonder is basically like, okay, so you have this kind of setup, which falls into our setting. And now you want to do like a surgery, like, so to, to get the original three manifold from this, you do surgery on these like alpha and beta curves, right? Uh, okay, so now the question is like, if, so if you had some surgery formula that said, that there was some sort of invariance property of this kind of ECH group under this kind of operation, then that would prove that would give you a kind of natural way of getting between the usual ECH and this kind of thing, right? Okay. So that's the kind of thing I'm imagining. I don't I don't think this really falls cleanly into the into the kind of surgery properties of Hager floor, the usual way that you do it. Any more questions? Yeah. You could also look at arcs, I guess. I mean, the whole theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you put like a, yeah, 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 yeah totally. If you, I, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, like you could also, I mean, the whole, this this whole formalism works if you replace these with uh, open, open exact Lagrangians. True, very true. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Let's, let's, yeah.